Welcome back to the Career Catharsis Show. I'm your host, Neha Koram, founder of Beam Career Coaching and Recruiting. Today, I'm chatting with the wonderful and wise Mike Betley, talent acquisition leader who has helped hire and retain talent at companies such as Google, Open Care, and is now taking on global sourcing at Thomson Reuters. Two key statements that stood out to me that guide Mike's approach to talent acquisition are first, that recruitment isn't about hiring people. It's about solving business problems. And secondly, everyone can and should write their own career story. If you need help with framing your career story, listen till the end to get help on crafting your career narrative. Thanks so much for joining me on the Career Catharsis Show, Mike. So excited to have you share your thoughts around job seeking as well as recruiting. So before we dive into the questions that I had for you today, I'd love for our listeners to get a better understanding of your career journey in recruiting. Well, thanks so much for having me. So I fell into recruitment like everybody else. I don't think anybody ever went to a careers day at school and said, I want to be a recruitment consultant. Um, But I I came out of school and I needed a job. And back then kind of the options were either sales or recruitment. And I felt like recruitment was more people focused. So I did that. Um, I worked at an agency in the UK. It was terrible. I was a solid maybe four to five out of 10 as a agency recruiter. Uh, I was not good at it. I I didn't enjoy it. And I thought, you know, if this is what recruitment is, I'm not interested in it. Um, So I I was starting to look at just running away from it. I didn't have a direction to run in, but it was just like, I'm not enjoying this. And serendipitously, uh, someone at Google actually reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to go and do a contract role at Google in Mm -hmm. Ireland? so with kind of without thinking, I just said yes and packed up my car and moved to Ireland. And I was like, cool, wow. this will be a 10 month adventure and ended up being sort of three and a half years. Uh, I did a lot of like very technical recruiting uh, for Google's data centers and networking teams, got really deep in the leads there, which was great. Got to travel around Europe to some some fun, fun locales. And yeah, uh, eventually my, my partner decided uh, they wanted to return to Canada. So kind of we moved over here and I joined a smaller company called Flip, which at the time going from Google that was 120,000 people to 400 people was uh, just mind blowing, right? Like the scale and, and the difference was just ridiculous. So joined them, uh, helped them scale by, by sort of 25% in a year, which was really exciting and and pretty challenging and then after a year I met the the then CEO of OpenCare uh, Mm -hmm. who needed to make their first recruiting hire and I somewhat naively said yes little knowing what the next (laughs) two and a half (laughs) years were going to involve but took it from 20 to 140 people lots of challenges, lots of learnings along the way. And now I am just getting ready to transition into the next kind of phase of my career where I'm Mm -hmm. joining Thomson Reuters to lead their global sourcing function. So Mm -hmm. that's going from, you know, uh, a small company up to a 25,000 person company Mm -hmm. in 75 countries, which, you know, different set of challenges, different set of complexity. So I've kind of seen all aspects and I keep trying to just hone in on where's the right place for me to be. Love that. So initially you were deciding between sales and recruiting and getting on that agency side, realizing that agency really isn't for me. So something that you mentioned about your first contract at Google, very nonchalant of you to say, well, someone reached out to me and asked me to join Google. (laughs) Can you, can you kind of share a little bit more? Like, was it really that easy? I know that Google is a very, you know, sought after company. (laughs) Everyone not everyone, but a lot of people would love to work there. So how did that happen for you? Yeah, so um, it was uh, one of the, the guys there, they were looking to expand their, their sourcing team. So he 
his sourcing strategy was to go and look at people that had been to the same university as him and they were doing recruitment and that was it that's how he found mm-hmm. me he literally just sent me a linkedin message and i thought it was a joke i, I didn't <laughs> think it was real I, I took the call anyway and you know there was obviously interviews and, and so forth but you know a lot of people mm-hmm. obviously are not in the position to just up sticks and move their life to a different country mm-hmm. for a for a contract right like it was 10 months no guarantee of anything after that and you know yeah. I probably should have given it a bit more thought than I did but <laughs> I didn't I just said yes and, and went for it and kind of the rest is is history as it were so you know I, I do think you, you know obviously there was, there was an element of, of me interviewing and, and kind of knowing what I was mm-hmm. doing and I was very lucky that I was I was pretty well trained in, in my agency but at the end of the day it was just the willingness to to kind of take the opportunity when it came and, and that 100 percent changed the trajectory of my career and it's still something that you know a lot of people you know it gives me a lot of credibility <laughs> rightly or wrongly a lot of people are like oh crap you worked at, at google you must know right. what you're doing and i'm like i knew a lot less at google than i do now but um you know it opens doors for me and sometimes mm-hmm. when these opportunities come up you've just got to say yes and, and kind of figure a way through it For sure. I think there's certain opportunities where you have to take that leap of faith. So sometimes a contract can really do a lot more for your career than you would expect. So thank you for sharing that. And what would you say is your advice for job seekers that are seeking to discover their strengths? You know, you talked a little bit about not really knowing what you wanted to do after college. And now that you've been in recruiting for quite a while, I know that you've also done a bit of coaching on the side what can you share for listeners that are looking to discover their strengths in their job search? Yeah. So I think the first thing is I still don't know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like every, every kind of step I've taken in my career has been intentional, but it's not, I'm not aiming to get to this fixed point in the future. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have this career journey mapped out. I don't have this one position that I want to get at the end. Like, which I think is like the very traditional narrative around what career planning is. And Mm -hmm. that didn't work for me. And so kind of how I got into coaching was like helping folks that were in a similar position that they were like, I I don't, I don't have this position. I don't want to be a CEO. CEO. I don't want to be a COO. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think the traditional um, structures break down when you, when you take away like this fixed point in the future that you have to get to. So, you know, I I think in terms of determining your strengths, there's a couple of different things that I rely on. So one is obviously sort of personality tests. Um, I do think they're tremendously powerful in terms of just helping you understand a little bit more about yourself. So 16 personalities, which is based Mm -hmm. on Myers-Briggs, is one that I, you know, it's free. It it talks in a really human way about like strengths, weaknesses and, and so forth. I think the second piece is, you know, you, there are kind of two dimensions that give you strength. Um, one is competence and the other is commitment. Um, so this is like le- leaning on a framework from situational leadership, which is, you know, something that I am I'm really use on a, on a regular basis. But competence is your ability. That is like, I have the skills to do this thing. And your commitment is how much you enjoy doing it and how much you prioritize doing it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, your strength can come either from you know, being particularly skilled at it, but that also has to be matched with the level of commitment to that activity. So for example, for me, I'm now what, like nine or yeah, nine years into my career. Mm-hmm. I can send good reach out emails to candidates. I can get people excited. I have the competence. Do I want to do that at this point in my career? Absolutely not. It is the biggest energy Mm -hmm. drainer that I have to do in my job. And so like, although I have the competence, my commitment isn't there. So it's not a strength of mine. I can do Mm -hmm. it, but it's it's not my strength because it drains energy out to me. And so that's really kind of the, the, the sort of way I talk about it with, with folks that I'm coaching is like, what are your energy generators and what are your energy drainers? And mm-hmm. those activities that generate energy for you, if you actually kind of map it out and write down, you know, on a week, on, on, on a monthly basis, these are the things I really look forward to. Mm-hmm. These are the meetings. These are the 
activities that I really like. Um, these are the ones that I dread. If you map it out, you'll start to identify what are the consistent patterns. Okay, so you mm -hmm. like all of the meetings where you're talking with you know, these individuals. Okay, well, what is it about talking to those individuals? Is it just being in the conversation? Okay, cool. Like the relationship is really important to you. That's fine. Now we're identifying something that generates energy for you. Um, so, you know, I think generally, especially earlier in your career where you maybe don't have as much competence, but you have a lot of commitment and excitement about what you're doing, identifying the things that generate energy for you mm -hmm. is going to be a great way of you harnessing that energy in a positive way and building skills over time. So, you know, if you are a, you know, I'm an extrovert, if I have to do a job where I don't talk to people at all, I find it really challenging. I find it really hard to focus and just sit there and write documentation. Again, I can do it, but it, you know, I don't want to do that as a right. job. I've never taken a technical writer job because I would hate it. Right. And it, it doesn't mean it's a good, bad, a good job or a bad job. It doesn't mean I'm a good professional or a bad professional. It's just like, these are my preferences. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, rather than trying to identify, you know, I have these strengths, you know, instead look at, you know, these are the things that, you know, my, my personality naturally lends itself to. These mm -hmm. are the aspects of my job today or my prior experiences that I really enjoy. How do I find something that, that doubles down on that? How do I find things that, that, you know, lean into those positive attributes and try and minimize the negative bits? <laughs> we have agreement here. <laughs> yeah. One second. For well, sure. Have a, have a slight break. Sure. Oh. To get out of the screen. Okay. <laughs> So a lot of great insight there around competence and confidence, really identifying what your energy drainers are, what gives you energy before we are able to really articulate what your strengths are. And something else that you mentioned earlier on was around personality assessments. Those are a really good way to bring some of that self-awareness -aware and honesty to light. So I love 16 personalities. I love that you mentioned that one. I realized I kind of flip-flop between two different types of personalities. So I think it's surprising also when you take the test when you're sort of in work mode versus in your personal life. That's kind of where I end up acting a bit differently, which is really insightful for me. Um. And I know that in the past, we've chatted about accomplishment-based resumes. So I'd like for you to share a bit about what that means and how it's different than simply listing responsibilities as we commonly see from job applicants. Yeah, so I'll take it back a little bit to thinking about a resume as a marketing document um, and really thinking about kind of why is the company hiring? What is the recruiter there to do? And fundamentally, the reason the company is hiring is that they have a set of business problems that they do either don't have the skills, don't have the capacity, or don't have the capability to solve today. And that's why they are looking externally to hire someone to solve that problem. And so really understanding, you know, what do you think the business problem is? that they're trying to solve and tailoring the resume to speak to the actual core business problem, not to, you know, I pick up the phone and I call so many clients per day, right? Like that's not what the business is paying you for. The business is paying you for the outcome of that work, which is, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a, let's take a sales role, for example, you know, you can say I do 250 cold calls a day. Great. That's not actually what the business wants. The business wants to increase their revenue or they want to break into a new market or they want to increase customer satisfaction, like whatever their, their priorities are. So you just saying I can do 250 cold calls a day doesn't actually tell me if you can achieve the outcome that I need from a, from a business perspective. So instead, when I talk about achievement-based resumes, it's really about you know, taking that 250 cold calls a day. What does that actually drive for your business? I don't care if you did 250 cold calls a day, 500 or 10. What I care about is how many dollars did you bring into the company 
over over your tenure, over a month, over a quarter, over a year, whatever. And so, you know, being able to really talk about how your activities and how you, what your contribution was to the company as a whole in real tan in a really tangible way, far more important than saying that you did these things. You know, if you did 250 cold calls, that's great. But if you only signed on one customer and then there's somebody else that did 20 cold calls and signed on five customers, I, I want to take the person that has, you know, the, the much higher hit rate. So, you know, listing out responsibilities, anybody in any company at any stage in their career can write the same list of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. If you're a salesperson in a startup or in an enterprise company or in, you know, a pharmaceutical company, you can write the same list of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But nobody can tell your story of the things that you specifically have accomplished. Um, they're unique to you. And you should always try to quantify them. You should always talk about, you know, dollar amounts. Um, one of the big things that I push people to do is, is calculate the delta mm -hmm. the difference between kind of where you started from and where you took it to. And to um, kind of quantify that as a percentage. So a lot of what a lot of people do will that they'll say like you know my conversion where it went from twenty percent to twenty two percent, okay, well that's not a two percent increase, that's a ten percent increase. Like mm -hmm. the delta between where you started from and where you got to is is a ten percent increase, and a ten percent mm -hmm. increase indicates to me as a recruiter how it how impactful that was, universally. Mm -hmm. Like if you say a ten percent increase in revenue, a ten percent increase in number of people you talk to, like. You can, you can understand how much effort was required to actually move that dial. If I said that I increased something by 100%, you'll immediately get, be able to go, okay, that's, that's pretty big. That's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Versus if you say, you know, I you know, improved this conversion rate from 35 to 38%, right. that could be 100% year over year growth. You, but you don't know because you're like, that's 3%. I don't really understand enough about the candidate's business to know if that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. did, was that three percent for you and bob sat two dollars down from you increased it by mm -hmm. eight percent you know is that good or bad but if you say a hundred percent like the the delta then it's mm -hmm. easy to understand so sorry that was maybe not the the most concise way of explaining that but <laughs> um yeah I, I think talking about your achievements relating it back to what your activities and what your impact on the business has been in total um, is is how you stand out from everybody else who writes, I do these activities on a day-to-day -day basis and I hope something good happens. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think that talking about your own initiatives and what you owned and what impact that you had versus sort of you know, you don't want your resume looking like the job description when you first applied. If you're, if it looks like that, then for sure there's something that is missing in terms of what's so special about you and, you know, your talent. And there's plenty of it. We just need to make sure that you're telling a great story around that. So I like the idea of tying it to metrics and conversion rates and that that really helps quantify efforts. I do think there's a lot of people that I've spoken to that you know, they don't necessarily see a lot of their tasks as quantifiable necessarily. They might be qualitative. Do you have any insight around that? Because I have seen some resumes where sometimes I'll see like people are trying, you know, they'll, they'll put like 30% increase in, and then it's a very qualitative, you know, message that follows. So how do we, you know, encourage job applicants to be honest, first of all, but also, um, you know, if they're getting stuck in that trap of, well, I don't have any numbers to share. How do I quantify my achievements in my resume? Yeah. So look, qualitative improvements are, mm -hmm. are data and their improvements as well. But what you need to provide is a bit more context. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you're going to say like, I improved customer satisfaction, okay, well, you know, that may not be, you may not be able to put a, a number. Maybe you don't have an NPS score or something like that. Mm -hmm. But if you give me the context that the CEO said that, you know, company priority for this year was to improve, um, you know, was to improve 
customer satisfaction and I did not churn a single account compared mm -hmm. to everybody else on my team. Like you've given me enough context there to say, well, look, the, you as a candidate understand kind of what the company priority is. And you can also, you've also proven to me that your performance is different to everybody else on your team. So what you're already showing me there is like, you are a top mm -hmm. performer in your team compared to everyone around you. And that's, you know, fundamentally everyone wants to hire you know the top performers for sure um for the problems that they're solving so you know it doesn't mean that you have to be the person that's closing the most amount of deals it doesn't mean that you have to be the engineer that's writing the most most lines of code it the top performer is subjective based on the problem that they're coming mm. to solve in the organization so you know take that time to diagnose like what are they actually saying when they're describing the role what do you think you know what has the ceo written about what the priority for the company is over the year. Mm -hmm. How do you tailor your resume to highlight the things that you're um, strong at that will make you a top performer for you know, the prospective company's challenges, not for what you do today? And sure. honestly, if that seems like a lot of work, probably tells you that it's not the organization that you're excited to work for. And you should, you know, taking it back to, to energy generators mm -hmm. and detractors if you don't have the energy to write a customized resume and a customized set of achievements, either you haven't done enough research on the company to be excited, or it's just not the right fit for you. And you may as well just move on and find something that does excite you. Mm. Because like, you know, especially you know, a lot of these conversations I have with you know, people who are earlier in their career, mm -hmm. the biggest asset that you have is your passion, excitement, and energy. So you need to find places that will allow you to harness that and then build those skills that will make you more valuable as you go through your career. For sure. I think what you mentioned about diagnosing what problems the company wants you to solve and then taking stock of, well, what was the company priority, you know, um, that maybe your current company or your previous company had and how did your performance tie to that priority? And then the bigger piece here is does this relate is it resonating with where i'm trying to take my career where i'm trying to solve you know xyz set of problems so yeah i think adding that context is is huge which i don't think you can do with a list of responsibilities so you really do have to take an inventory of accomplishments to really play to your strengths in the market so great points there and what other advice would you have around building confidence for any job seekers that might be struggling with building their confidence as they go through their job search? It's always a challenge, right? And I, I think one of the, the biggest, the biggest kind of misunderstandings I had, especially, you know, even, even until relatively recently was looking ahead and assuming that everybody else has everything figured out mm -hmm. and assuming and like that's the thing that really undermines confidence more than anything else is looking around you and thinking or, or looking slightly ahead of you to those people that you're like i'd lo love to do their job mm -hmm. and looking at them and being like well they have it all figured out and i don't know what i'm doing and i don't have these skills and i don't have you know i didn't go to this university or whatever and that's what erodes the confidence whereas the reality is that everybody is just you know, making the best decisions that they can at that mm -hmm. moment in time. There isn't, you know, nobody has it figured out. No, nobody yeah. has the answers. Like as much as I, you know, I love coaching people, but one of the first things I, you know, statements I make to them is that I don't have any answers for them. I'm right. there to ask them questions and help them uncover kind of what they want to do and make those decisions. But I'm not mm -hmm. there to, I don't know what the what best choice is for you. Only you know what the best choice is for you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think focusing more, more inwardly on, you know, again, those energy generators versus detractors, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're never going to feel confident if you're doing a job that drains you of energy every day. And you're just like, yep, today was a crappy day and tomorrow will be a crappy day <laughs> versus, you know, if you're saying, you know, I don't have the answer, but I'm really excited about the problem or I'm really excited about the space that I'm working in. So I'm going to put in that extra mm -hmm. half an hour because i really want to understand this even if you don't have the answer you're going to be invigorated by the whole experience of discovering and mm -hmm. learning rather than being frustrated by not 
knowing how to move forward. So again, you know, if, if you're really struggling for, for confidence, uh, you know, it kind of depends on where you're at. Like speak to mentors, speak to um, friends and family, speak to people who, you know, who you look up to in your personal and professional life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, can be anyone from your parents through to family friends, through to, you know, people that, you know, older brothers and sisters and their mm -hmm. friends, like ask them about how they made their decision. Ask them about how they overcame moments of, com uh, of um, sort of failing confidence because we've mm -hmm. all been through it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm taking on this new job and mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh, you must be so excited. And for sure I am like, yeah, I, it's a really cool opportunity, but I'm terrified. Like I'm mm -hmm. absolutely terrified about doing <laughs> it. And, you know, I, I'm sort of 10 years into my career and like, I know a lot of the aspects of what I have to do in this job. And I've been very transparent about what I can do and what I can't do and mm -hmm. have great support around me and, and Jesper and Ryan, but I'm still terrified. I'm terrified mm -hmm. that I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm terrified that I'm, you know, I'm not going to be able to live up to those expectations. So mm -hmm. that lack of confidence, I'm sorry to tell you all, doesn't go away. It doesn't mm -hmm. magically evaporate once you get a certain title. Um, you know, and I think if you're, I, I spoke about this on another podcast that like, I went into open care woefully overconfident in my own capabilities mm -hmm. and I wasn't scared enough and I didn't understand enough about kind of what I was taking on and the challenges that were going to come ahead. Um, so yeah, lean into the, lean into the, the sort of that, that feeling of uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. That's where the growth happens is where you're feeling uncomfortable, where you're, you're pushing yourself um but you know take it back to you know does, is this role or is this you know next step in my career gonna gonna use my strengths to my advantage or am i you know making compromises and i'm gonna do something that's gonna drain energy from me 24 7 um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think there's a piece here where for sure you want to be moving forward with what gives you energy and where your strengths currently are, but a lot of growth requires building strength in areas you might not currently have strength in. And I think another piece about confidence that you mentioned was looking to people that you wish you were doing what they were doing or you had their title. And in order to get to that step, you do have to develop strengths in some areas that you might not currently have. So identifying those gaps and then what I like to say is confidence takes practice. So you have to practice being confident in those areas before, you know, you can actually say that you are confident in that area. I guess it's sort of like another way of saying fake it till you make it. Um, <laughs> um, but, but it really does take practice. If something's completely new to you or if it's sort of just been an idea, but it's not something that you've, you know, um, brought out into the real world, um, nothing that you've executed just yet, then, you know, there's always this excitement about ideas and what could be. And it's great to explore that. But then um, actually executing on it is, is going to be a little bit of a bumpy road. And, and it's something that everybody, everybody faces. So I love that you mentioned that because I've had people ask me um, straight up, they've asked, do you think CEOs you know, get insecure? Do you think that they struggle with confidence? And I'm willing to bet that they totally do, right? Everyone, everyone has had one of those moments and probably more so in one area than another, just again, going to what you said about strengths, right? So um, yeah, growth will require you to push yourself. Yeah. I mean, to take it back full circle, what I talked about at the start, like your strengths are you know, the output of your competence and your commitment. You can turn mm -hmm. something that you're not competent into, into a strength by being exceptionally committed to it. So, you know, if you, for me, like when I was earlier in my career, like a lot of recruitment nowadays is very like heavily metrics driven. Like you have mm -hmm. to understand the numbers. And I didn't enjoy that at the start of my career. Uh, I found it like I understood how it worked, but I didn't like it. I didn't think that was like, it wasn't relationship based. Mm. So I didn't care about it, but I realized that was what I had to, to be good at to, to sort of progress. And so my commitment to it 
mm-hmm. um, was very, very high. Because I was like, this is kind of yeah. a zero sum game. I've got to do it. And now it's something that is a particular strength of mine because mm-hmm. like my, my sheer force of will of saying, well, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure out right. a way that this is meaningful for me. It's meant that it went from being something that was a weakness into a strength for me. Mm-hmm. Um, not because I was naturally great at it, but just because I knew that I had to, I had to get there. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, and yeah, everybody is constantly having like moments of, of, low confidence in different mm-hmm. aspects of their life you know um mm-hmm. you know, i just don't i don't think anyone ever gets over that i don't think there's anyone that's like ever 100 percent confident in all things you know? <laughs> um, yeah the human condition i guess <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly and i think as we progress in our careers we'll continuously be discovering new strengths and again there's just a lot of work behind each of those so what would you say has been a highlight of your career so far? Yeah, this is a question that I've been asked a couple of times recently by different folks. Um, mm-hmm. Without doubt, for me, it's the people that I've developed along the way. Um, mm. And I, I think there's two aspects to it. One is around, I, I really enjoy coaching. It's the thing that brings me the most sort of energy um so spending time working with people to help them identify their strengths help them make those decisions that are hard to hard to make you know teaching different skills um especially related to to recruiting is something that i really enjoy Mm -hmm. but i think the second aspect to this is like a large part of your ability to coach and develop people is really hinged upon the environment that you create for them to operate in. Mm -hmm. Welcome to working from home. (laughs) Um, Maybe we'll go back and do this. So the second piece of being able to coach and develop people is about the environment that you create for them to operate in. If you create an environment of high trust, high psychological safety, people will be willing to to try things which people will be willing to ask the mm-hmm. um kind of quote unquote stupid questions right and, right right you know be be open to trying to push past those those areas where they don't have strength and they don't have um kind of high commitment or high confidence mm-hmm. and find ways to overcome those obstacles and you know i really love the fact that that the teams that I've developed and the individuals that I've developed have gone on to lead their own teams and have Mm -hmm. gone on and and use those skills and elevated them to a different level. Like, you know, I I don't think coaching and developing people is that hard. Mm -hmm. Right. And I I know that is maybe, maybe a (laughs) somewhat controversial thing to say, but (laughs) what I mean by that is like, if you really care for the people that are working with you and the people that you're trying to develop, it, mm-hmm. it's not that challenging. Spend time with them, listen to them, create a space where they, they know that you have, that you have their back mm-hmm. and you'll be amazed by what individuals can, can do when they don't feel like they have to be performative and they don't feel like they have to like always say the right thing to be on your good side. Mm-hmm. So, um, so sure. I think that's that's the basis of it, and like I'm really really proud of of every single person that I've I've worked with. They're they're all, you know, on a path to to do much bigger and better things than I will ever accomplish. And I think there's <laughs> there's nothing nothing greater um, to mm-hmm. to do for someone. Yeah, I think a lot of leaders have the opportunity to be catalysts for other people's careers. And what you said about coaching and developing people not necessarily being the hardest thing to do, I think a big part of that is simply just having the intention to develop others. And so many of the actions and I would say emotions in that relationship move in the right direction when you have the right intention to develop others. So I I love that. And before we hop off, I would love to get any last thoughts that you have to share with listeners around developing their strengths or any sort of job seeking tips, anything that you'd think would be useful? Yeah. 
so a couple of couple of sort of parting thoughts one is like don't try and skip through your career too quickly um definitely a mistake that i made was chasing title chasing importance um spoiler the title won't make you happy um so don't don't try and rush don't try and like artificially inflate your title too early in your career take the time um learn the skills that you need to be world class at whatever profession that you're in um and those titles will come and you know and, and be all that more rewarding and meaningful once you're at that that level the second piece is like when you're making career decisions not every opportunity that you take is going to take all of the boxes right like not every opportunity is just going to be all energy generating activities and nothing energy detracting right mm -hmm. some, some stuff is going to be energy detracting and but like you know it's going to teach you something it's going to teach you a skill it's going to teach you resilience it's going to you know there's a different aspect to the job that really appeals to you there might be a mentor there there might be someone you can learn from but it's going to be a grind Mm -hmm. all of those are good compromises to make but just be intentional about what's the compromise you're making don't go into it saying you know this job's going to be amazing and i'm going to love every aspect of it knowing mm -hmm. full well that it's going to require you to do a lot of things that aren't necessarily your your favorite activities um and finally like the next opportunity for you doesn't have to look like the opportunity that you're in um mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily have to be like level you know, I thought, I thought I wanted to work in startups. I thought I wanted to always be kind of, you know, the super small companies, get them off the ground, do loads of hiring, then do it again. Mm -hmm. And the experience at Open Care was amazing. The people are, are truly incredible, but it's not for me. I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't enjoy it. Like it's chaos. It's constantly changing and that doesn't fit great with my personality and mm -hmm. I persevered because there's lots of positive as aspects to it and it taught me a lot about myself but it's not where I want to go long term and so like this move into a much larger company is intentional and you know there will be things that I don't mm -hmm. enjoy about a large company and there'll be things that I do enjoy yeah. and then afterwards you know whenever my my time at Thomson Reuters comes to an end I'll then evaluate whatever the next mm -hmm. journey is going to be. And it might be smaller. It might be bigger again. It might be more senior. It might be more junior. Mm -hmm. Like I'll evaluate that based on what's important to me at that time. So, you know, don't, don't just go chasing title, go and find something that's actually meaningful for you at this point in mm -hmm. your, your career. It's going to teach you something about your skill set, about yourself. Um, and that's, that's where you'll find, uh, find a, a long and healthy career that's full of challenges. I love that. I think a lot of tidbits of insight there and just something about uh, honesty and self-reflection, self-awareness. I think those pieces are key here. And touching base on your move from a smaller company to a larger company, something that I had a mentor once tell me is you want to layer your experience across different company sizes. And I thought that was really useful because I think some of the challenges that you might get burnt out with, which initially are so exciting and, you know, rewarding in a smaller company from that excitement stage, you can often then get into that burnout phase and then moving into a bigger company, then you may eventually get to a point where perhaps you're not feeling as challenged. So layering it is a great way, not only for your own energy, but also in terms of learning about process, whether you want to kind of learn about the building phase or how something's already built and you know, the layers on top of process that I think for some people can be a little bit overwhelming. But anyways, that's just a little bit of insight that I got out of what you said and really appreciate all your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naya. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Career Catharsis with the wonderful Mike Betley, Talent Acquisition Leader. As a thank you for listening to today's episode of You've Got Talent, I'm offering a 10% discount on coaching calls to help you with your job search. Simply visit beamcareercoaching.com 
forward slash one hour coaching call separated by dashes. That is beamcareercoaching.com forward slash one hour coaching call. And you can find the link in the show notes of the podcast, whatever platform you're listening to. And there you'll find the discount code as well as a button to subscribe for more workplace wellness and career transformation stories in future episodes. Can't wait to hear from you. Chat soon.